I mentioned before uh, at one of the talks that we've had here that I've become a big fan of Chip and Dan Heath since their first book called Made to Stick. And uh, I just recently finished their most recent uh, publication, I think their fourth book, called The Power of Moments. The Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath. And basically it's a book that focuses on how certain experiences in our lives can jolt us and can transform us. The potential within certain moments of life to have that kind of effect. And one of the stories they tell in this book is about someone named Doug Dietz, who is an industrial designer working for General Electric. And he spent a number of years working on developing a new MRI machine. And in 2007, he had the chance to see it being installed in a hospital. And he went hanging out in the hallway, waiting to see the first patients coming into the new room. And he said that he felt like a proud papa going to see his baby. As he was waiting in the hallway, he saw the first group of people about to come into this room. And it was a couple that were bringing their young daughter who was crying her eyes out. And the young girl's father bent down to her and reassured her that everything was going to be okay and that she could be very brave. But then as soon as the girl entered the room, she froze, terrified. And at that moment, Dietz could see the way the room must have appeared through her eyes. On the wall, there was a giant warning sign with a magnet and a huge exclamation point. On the floor were yellow and black tape that looked like it should have been in a crime scene. The room was dim with fluorescent flickering lights and the walls were an antiseptic beige. The atmosphere was sterile, bordering on menacing. And Dietz knew that the experience would only get worse. The little girl would be fed through a claustrophobic tube and be expected to lie motionless for 30 minutes, trying to ignore the machine's loud and strange hums and clanging. And looking at the anguished parents and looking at this young girl, Dietz was crushed. And in an instant, his pride turned to horror. Dietz realized that he and his colleagues were simply focused on designing a machine. But the parents and the patients focused on the experience. And if a patient feared the MRI, which many of the children did, then there could be real health consequences. For example, 80% of the children had to be sedated. And that itself carries its own risks. So after this epiphany in the MRI suite, Dietz reframed his mission. Now to be a designer, to see if he could design an experience that could actually be fun. And with a team of consultants, he came to realize the power of a child's imagination. And that power can transform an experience. In a very powerful TED talk that Dietz delivered, he asked, what is three chairs and a blanket? Well, to a child, it's a castle, it's a spaceship, it's a truck. 
So what if the MRI were not an MRI machine? What if it was a spaceship or a submarine? And his team went about reimagining the scanner as part of a larger story. At the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, they designed the Jungle Adventure. In the hallway leading into the room, they placed stickers on the floor that looked like rocks. And the kids would instinctively hop from one rock to the next as they came into the suite. The walls of the room were painted with rich, vibrant, colorful jungle scenes. The rocks from the hallway led to a painted koi pond stocked with fish surrounding the machine. The MRI table was now designed so that it lowered and the kids could climb up onto it. And it was redesigned to look like a hollowed out canoe. The kids were urged to hold still so they wouldn't tip the canoe over while they were being tested. And to the kids, they were magically floating through the jungle on this canoe. Now, like Dietz, we all have experiences in our lives that serve as wake-up calls. For the Jewish community, our 9-11 moment were the results published in a number of population surveys taken of the American Jewish community. If you read the reaction of North American Jewry to these published reports, it was nothing less than a shocking wake-up call. In 1990, the Jewish population study of American Jews revealed that 12% of American Jews were practicing a religion other than Judaism. When the same study was released 10 years later in the year 2000, the number doubled to 25% of American Jews following a religion other than Judaism. In 2013, the very famous Pew Research Center released its study of American Jewry and found that while 17% of North American Jews belonged to a synagogue, 32% had Christmas trees. The study found that one-third of millennial Jews don't identify with being Jewish in a religious way as being part of a religion at all. They don't identify with the religion of Judaism at all. And 68% of those millennials raising children, 68% are not raising them to be Jewish in any way, shape, or manner whatsoever. Forget about religion. Even as kugel eaters, they're not raising their kids to be Jewish at all. This study in 2013 found that the rate of intermarriage of non-Orthodox Jews had climbed to 72% in the United States. And these numbers to every single concerned Jew was nothing less than shocking. This past summer, the Canadian Jewish News had a cover story, feature story, about why so many Jews are attracted to Buddhism. The estimates are that in North America, between 25 to 30 percent of Buddhists that are born here in North America come from a Jewish background. 25 to 30 percent of North American Buddhists come from a Jewish background. And more than that, the major leaders, teachers, writers on Buddhism are Jewish. Everyone today is familiar with Buddhist mindfulness practice. It's the flavor of the month. And very few people realize that mindfulness practice was brought to North America by three Jews who brought it back from India 
and they opened up a meditation center in Barry, Massachusetts. When I first came to Toronto 25 years ago, I was working as the chaplain at the University of Toronto, running the Jewish Student Union. And I was part of the Interfaith Council, and one day the Hindu chaplain invited me to speak at his Hindu temple downtown Toronto on a street called Emmet Avenue. And I said to myself, you know, I'm going to take this speaking engagement. I'm going to go because maybe there will be one or two Jews there. And when I think back to this Sunday morning that I went, I still shake inside because when I walked into that Hindu temple, I will tell you that it was crawling with Jews. It was crawling with Jews. Mainly women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Jewish women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I prepared my remarks that day for those Jews that would be coming, the two or three Jews that would be there. And after my talk, they all came over to me, all these Jews, and they were angry. They were angry. And basically what they said to me was, how come we never heard this before? How come we never heard what you're saying before? Here in this part of Canada, we have a sizable Sikh population. And one of the leading Sikh teachers is a man named Hari Nam Singh Khalsa. Hari Nam Singh Khalsa was born David Friedman in the Kensington Market section of Toronto about 66 years ago. A number of years ago, I went to Mississauga to a Sufi gathering. The Sufis are a mystical sect of Islam. And this was a group that with dervishes, they did the twirling. It was quite fascinating watching them. And I found out afterwards that the leader of this Sufi group was a Jewish Holocaust survivor. Despite the fact that people think that cults died out in the 1980s, there are still thousands of cults, destructive cults, that are flourishing in North America. And unfortunately, Jews make up a disproportionate percentage of members of these groups. There are hundreds of New Age religions in the world today. Newer religions, like Baha'i. You should not be surprised to find out that a tremendous percentage of people that are Baha'i are Jews. When I was a university student, I was very attracted to Baha'i. The truth is that Jews today are in every ism in the world, and sometimes the last is Judaism. And of course, the largest of these groups is what Rabbi Shlomo Karabach used to refer to as Jews for nothing. When we have a moment of heightened awareness through one of these wake-up calls, it prompts a response. Whenever a person goes through an experience and has an awakening and comes to a realization, it calls upon them to respond. Those of you familiar with the Grace After Meals with the Birkat HaMazon, so you probably noticed that there's a very unsettling line at the very end, which is quoting from Psalm 37. And the line says, Na'ar hayiti gam zakanti, velo ra'iti tzadik ne'ezav v'zaro mevakesh lachem usually translated that I was a youth, I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen a righteous man forsaken or his children begging for bread. Now anyone that's sensitive that reads that says, say what? Never seen a righteous person forsaken or his children begging for bread? It's ma'isem shebechol yom. It happens every day. So how do we understand this? 
So Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs, in his wonderful edition of the prayer book and his commentary, translates the verse a little bit differently, and I think he gets it correctly. He says that the Hebrew here, lo ra'iti, is not really, should not be understood to mean, I have not seen. But he says, really, you can find a parallel usage of this phrase in the scroll of Esther, in Megillat Esther. In chapter 8, verse 6, when Esther, who is pleading on behalf of the Jewish people, says, For how can I watch the evil that shall come upon my people? How can I watch the destruction of my kindred? So it's not to see, but it means to watch, to stand as a passive witness. And the translation, therefore, of Isaac says should be, I was once young and now I'm old, and I never stood by and just watched a righteous person being forsaken or his children begging for bread. That's really what's being proclaimed here. And I believe that that has to be our response to this demographic nightmare that we are facing as a people. We cannot just stand by and watch passively. That is impossible. That is unacceptable. The Bible says, Don't stand idly by the blood of your brethren. When we see Jewish people today that are going lost, we say now that if you're Jewish, the chances are your grandchildren won't be. That's an incredible tragedy. And no one could sit back, should sit back, and just watch that happen. The Torah says in the book of Devarim, chapter 22, in the beginning, there's a mitzvah of hashavat aveda. If someone's animal gets loose and they're lost, and you find their animal, you have a biblical obligation to try to restore their property to them. It's the biblical commandment of Hashavat Aveda, returning lost property. And the holy Orachayim, the Orachayim HaKadosh, in his commentary to the Torah says, if we're commanded to return a person's animal to them, all the more so to return a person's lost soul to their true heritage. In the book of Samuel, Shmuel Aleph, the first book of Shmuel, there's a very tragic story where our Aaron Kodesh, the holy ark from our tabernacle, is captured by the Philistines. And they kept it for many months until finally it was miraculously returned to the Jewish people. But our sages have a very trenchant commentary to this story. And our sages say that God was disappointed by the apathy of the Jewish people for their lack of initiative and effort to try to retrieve the ark. It spent so many months in enemy hands. And according to the Midrash, this is what God said. If one of your children, I'm sorry, if one of their chickens, if one of their chickens went lost, would they not attempt everything in their power to get it back? So the saintly Chavetz Chaim, Israel Meir HaKohen, in his famous book, Chomat HaDat, says that today God's holy ark is in captivity. God's holy ark are his children. And we therefore have an obligation to strive to return our brothers and sisters to their true spiritual path. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who was the greatest Jewish legal authority of the 20th century, said that not only do we have an obligation to give ma'aser from our funds, to give 10% minimally, up to 20% of our money to charitable causes, he said that we should each donate 10% of our time to be involved with trying to help connect Jewish people that have strayed back to their faith. So the first lesson, I believe, 
that we can learn from disappearing Jews, as Alan Dershowitz refers to them as. The first lesson is to recognize our obligation to them. The second thing we need to learn and appreciate is who these people are. Who are the Jewish people today embracing Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Sufism, every ism but Judaism? Who are they? Over 2,600 years ago, our prophet Hosea proclaimed, my people are perishing due to a lack of knowledge. Years ago, I used to give out a Jewish IQ test. I published it when I was living in the States in a number of newspapers. I used to give it out on campus here at the universities. And it was sort of tongue-in-cheek, but there was a point to it. I would ask 10 questions. Who is the mother of Jesus, I would ask. It shouldn't surprise you that about every Jewish university student was able to answer that question. I would ask, who's the mother of Moses? Just about no one knew the answer to that. I would ask, could you name any of the Gospels in the New Testament? You'd be surprised how many Jewish kids could name one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I asked at the other side of the test, can you name any of the tractates in the Talmud? Just name one. Just about no one was able to answer that. I would ask the Jewish students, do you know what the word Trinity means? Sure, Trinity. It's the Christian belief in God as a Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I would ask, do you know what the word Taryag means? Taryag, what's that? Taryag is the Hebrew number, 613. That's how many commandments there are in the Torah. But our university students don't know that. What is the birthday of Jesus traditionally? Today. Everyone knows that. How about the birthday of Moses? And that's not just a Bubamaisa. We know that birth date. None of our university students know that. Our university students will know who wrote Das Kapital. Who wrote Das Kapital? Our university students know who wrote it. But if you ask them who wrote The Guide to the Perplexed, very few will know it. It's terrifying. It's terrifying that the vast majority of Jews here in North America cannot read Hebrew don't know their Jewish name, Hebrew name, if they have one. Not only did they never read the Bible, but they're unfamiliar with any of the great classics of Jewish thought and literature. The New York Times had an article years ago about a Jewish couple struggling in, their, in dealing with a child who was critically ill. And the mother said to the reporter that she was tempted to convert to Catholicism because they have a belief in an afterlife. How could you not cry? How could you not cry? That here a Jew is thinking about converting to another religion because they have a belief in the afterlife. And she has gone through this woman and probably countless others, their lives assuming that it's not a thing that Jews believe in. Not only is there massive illiteracy among our brothers and sisters, there's also something equally serious afoot. If I was to share with you the profile of a typical Jew for Jesus, and I've spoken to hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds, they will tell you that they went to Hebrew school, they had a bar, a bat mitzvah, their families lit Hanukkah candles, they had Passover seders, they went to the synagogue on the high holidays. That's what you hear about almost all of them. But they will tell you in the same breath that they never experienced any of it as something that was spiritual. To them, Judaism was a culture, an ethnicity, a heritage, a tradition, an identity, 
But that's it. It was never experienced as a rich spiritual path of personal transformation or a way of developing a personal relationship with God. And if you ask virtually any Jew who's embraced Christianity what they have now that they didn't have before, I assure you that you'll be told that what they have now is a relationship with God. The prophet Amos, in the eighth chapter of his book, God says that I'm going to send a famine to the earth, but it's not going to be a hunger for food or a thirst for water. It's going to be a tremendous need and thirst to hear the words of the Almighty. And that's what we're experiencing today. We're experiencing a generation of Jews who have not been given anything. They've not been given anything. There's a third thing that we need to know and appreciate about many of the Jews who today are not in synagogue, but are in churches or in ashrams. The Torah has a tremendously poignant drama about the continuity of our forefathers. Abraham was the progenitor of our people, and he has a son, Isaac. And we know that Isaac has been the one to receive the blessings of Abraham and the mandate and the mission to go forward and continue the work that Abraham had done but then what happens after Isaac? We know that Isaac has twins, Jacob and Esau. And we know that Esau was not really the most qualified person to take on the mantle of the Jewish people. But for some inscrutable reason, Isaac had his heart set on giving the blessings to Esau, the wrong son. And we know that his wife, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, devises a plot to dress up Jacob to appear to look like the other son, to look like Esau, and Jacob goes in and basically gets the blessings. But it's a very hair-raising drama because as we're going through the story, we're wondering, is the wrong son going to get the blessings? And at the very last moment, at the very last moment, before Isaac gives the blessings to Jacob, the Torah tells us a strange detail. The Torah says immediately before Isaac blesses Jacob, Vayarach es begadav, he smelled his clothing. He smelled his clothing. And our sages teach in the Midrash Al tikri begadov ella bogdov. Don't read this as he smelt his clothing. The word bogdov means rebels or traitors. It's interesting, by the way, that we wear clothing. The word beged for clothing. Why do we wear clothing? Because Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. They ate what they weren't supposed to eat, and their eyes are open, and they saw they were naked, they had to put on clothing. So the whole idea of clothing is related to rebelliousness. There are three other words, by the way, for clothing that all connect with the idea of rebelliousness. So the Talmud says, the sages teach us, don't read this that Jacob's clothing was smelled by his father Isaac. The, the sages say that Isaac smelled the rebels, the traitors that would be coming out of Jacob. And that's why he blessed him. Now what's going on here? Why would he bless him because of the traitors and rebels that would be coming out one day? And the Midrash goes on to tell two stories of such rebels. One is someone named Yosef Mishisa. Yosef, Yosef Mishisa was basically drafted 
by those who were going to destroy and sack the holy temple in Jerusalem. And they said to themselves, you know what, we don't want to go in there. We saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we know it's a little bit dangerous if you mess around with the Jewish stuff. So they said to this kid, Yosef Meshisa, you know what, you go in, and you take something, and you can keep it for yourself, and then you go back and get more stuff for us. So he comes out, what does he bring? He brings the menorah. And they're looking at the menorah, and they're looking at him, and they say, no way. <laughs> We'll take that. You can go back and get something else for yourself. At this moment, he starts to tremble. And he says, I already angered my father in heaven once. I'm not going in there and doing it again. And they say, no, we're telling you, you have to go in. We're not asking you. You've got to go in and get the stuff. Bring it out for us. He says, I already angered my father in heaven. And so they tried to bribe him. They said, you know what? We'll let you off from paying taxes for three years. No taxes. Just go in and get stuff for us. And he started crying and he says, I already angered my father in heaven once. I'm not doing it again. And so the Midrash tells us that they tortured him to death in the most horrible ways. But he refused. Refused to go in. And he died a martyr. Another, the other story that the sages teach us is about someone named Yokum Ish Tsroros. Yokum Ish Tsroros was a nephew of the great Talmudic sage Yossi ben Yoezer. And we're told that as Yossi ben Yoezer was being led to be crucified by the Romans, he's on a little donkey, a broken down 90 year old jalopy of a donkey. They're taking him out to be executed. And Joachim, his nephew, is riding on a beautiful horse, a beautiful steed. And as he passes his uncle, he sneers at him, and he mocks him, and he says, Ha ha! Look at the animal that you're riding on! And look at the animal, the beautiful animal that I'm riding on! So his uncle looks up and says to him about himself, he says, You know what? If this is what happens to someone who does the will of the Almighty, think about what's going to be with someone who doesn't do the will of the Almighty. And the Midrash tells us that those words entered his heart like the poison of a snake. And he went home and he built some kind of a crazy contraption where he gave himself the Dalad Misos Bastin, the four ways in which the court can execute someone. He somehow did, don't ask, it's in popular mechanics from the year 400 BCE, I don't, I don't know. But he, he ended up taking his life. And as he was on his last breaths, we're told that his soul entered paradise before that of his uncle. These are some of the holy traitors, the holy rebels of the Jewish people. And they are referred to as rebels, bogdim, because it's related to the word again, beged, clothing. Because clothing is not who you are. It's external to who you are. It's not the real you. It's often a cover-up, a disguise. But deep down inside, Deep down inside, that exterior beats the heart of a faithful, holy Jew. Ratzadik HaKoyin of Lublin used to always say that we are required not only to believe in God, we're required to believe in ourselves as well. To recognize that God does not make junk and that each one of us is created in the image of God, and each one of us has a holy soul. And so even though there are Jews who are in the wrong place, doing the wrong things, deep down inside, they're not just good, they're great and they're holy, and they're very spiritual. And the truth is, that from where I sit, 
I often don't blame these Jewish people for embracing other religions. I understand them perfectly well. The Talmud says, Lo achbara ganva, chura ganva. The Talmud says that the mouse is not the thief. It's the hole in the wall that no one repaired. That's the thief. Don't blame the mouse for eating the cheese. That's what mice do. They eat cheese. If you want to get upset, if you want to point your finger, don't point it at the Jews today that are in ashrams or in churches. They didn't make that hole in the wall. They just fell through it. These are Jews that could not tolerate the mediocrity of the Judaism they grew up with. And I don't blame them. They're searching for meaning. They're searching for passion. They're searching for spirituality. They're searching for God. And if they don't find it within the walls of the Jewish world in which they grow up, they will go elsewhere. And can we really blame them? They tell a story that there was a fellow that had a job as the signal man at a railway crossing. And his job was very simple. When he hears a train coming, he wants to make sure that no cars are going to go through the intersection. So he's got to take out his lantern and he's got to wave the lantern and make sure cars don't come. So one night he's at the job, he's been on this job for many years. He hears the blaring ringing of the, of the railroad, railroad car coming, the train coming, and he sees the headlights of a car coming. He goes into his little booth and he takes out his lantern, he waves it back and forth, and the car is not slowing down. And this person is freaking out, and he starts waving the lantern more and more furiously. The car doesn't slow down. And the driver goes through the intersection, through the railroad crossing, and he is basically smashed to smithereens by this train. There is a major lawsuit, and the family of this motorist sues the train company for $16 million. And at the trial, this signal man is the star witness. And they ask him what happened that night. And he tells the whole story, that he heard the train coming, and he saw the headlights of the car, and he goes and he gets his lantern, he's waving it back and forth. And on the basis of this testimony, the train company won the trial. They didn't have to pay any money. And the president of the train company comes over to him afterwards. He's sitting in the corner somewhere. He's, he's, he can't even sit up straight. He, he's so upset. And the, the president thanks him for his testimony. But then he sees the man is crying. And he says, why, why are you crying? And he says, you know, sir, I don't know what I would have said if anyone had bothered asking me, was your lantern lit? Rousseau Salanter, the great founder of the Musar movement, remarked that if in Volozhin, Volozhin was the center of vibrant, rich, Torah committed Jewry, he said, if there wasn't Beetle Torah, in Volozhin, if it wasn't for the fact that people in Volozhin were not studying Torah as much as they were supposed to, he says there wouldn't be Chilul Shabbos in Paris. The truth is that every single Jew in the world that is committed to Judaism, that's concerned about the Jewish people, We set the spiritual tone in the Jewish world. And aside from the fact that we have an obligation to try to teach people, to try to directly help people understand that yes, Judaism is spiritual, that Judaism does have practices like meditation, that Judaism does believe in God and having a relationship with God, that Judaism has a technology for personal growth and transformation. Aside from the fact that we have an obligation to 
teach people this. Because as, again, our prophet said, our people perish due to a lack of knowledge. They don't know who can blame them. But there's something deeper going on. It's the way we live in the privacy of our own homes that impacts the rest of the world. It's sort of a spiritual equivalent of the butterfly effect. They say that if there's a butterfly in New Mexico that flaps its wings, there may be a thunderstorm in Mississauga. Look it up on the internet. <laughs> so the truth is, as Rousseau Salanter said, that the fact that Jews that are serious about Judaism may be on their own, on their own spiritual journey, on their own spiritual path, not as intense as they should be, not studying as much Torah as they should be, not praying with as much intensity as they should be, that impacts Jews that they might never see in their life. How does that happen? So there's a story that's told. I've heard it about a number of different people, but it's a story that I once heard about Rav Yisrael, I'm sorry, Yosef Karo, about Rav Yosef Karo. Joseph Karo, who was the author of the Code of Jewish Law, the Shulchan Aruch. And the story has it that he was once studying a passage in the Talmud and he could not figure it out. He got stuck on a passage and he spent weeks and weeks and weeks just killing himself, working on it, staying up countless hours. He ended up fasting and praying and doing everything he could possibly do. How do I understand this piece of Talmud? Finally, after months of working on it, it comes to him. He's able to understand it. He's on cloud nine. He is thrilled. The next morning, he walks into the Beit Midrash, the study hall, and he passes. There's a, a father and his son studying Talmud. And what do you know? They're studying the same passage in the Talmud that he had been stuck on for months. And he hears this 10-year-old boy explaining it to his father, just as he had figured out. And he was crushed. He was so upset. So he goes to his teacher. And he complains to his teacher, it's not, so it's a low fair, it's, right? It's not fair. I killed myself for months. And this little kid, he, he's, he, he has it. So Yosef so, Karo's teacher says to him, you don't understand something. Before you brought this idea into the world, no one had it. But once you worked so hard on this, and you were able to articulate this idea. You were able to explain the Talmud. You put it out there. You brought it down. And it's now in the atmosphere. It's in the ether. And the fact that you made it available and you put it out there, this 10-year-old kid was able to access it. What each one of us does impacts the rest of the world. As our mystics explain, the Ramchal Moshe Chaim Lutzato explains, all Jewish people are one organism. We're one body. We're one body. And just like in one body, if you stub your toe, it hurts. So as a people, if any one of us is in pain, if any one of us is lost, it should hurt all of us. But the truth is that anything we do in this big body of the Jewish people, it impacts every other single Jew, whether they know it or not, whether they're conscious of it or not. And so I want to leave each of us here today with a challenge. Panina challenged all of us, and I'd like to leave two challenges. Number one, to appreciate and recognize that each of us has a tremendous responsibility to in some way make an effort to teach, to inspire, to share. Sharing is caring, as they say. To share what we have with someone else. And you don't have to be a scholar. If you even know how to read Hebrew, if you can say, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, 
You can teach someone who doesn't know how to read Hebrew. Hebrew. You could study a book together. If you have a Shabbat in your home, invite someone for Shabbat. I guarantee they'll be very appreciative. So number one challenge is let's make an effort, each one of us, to try to directly share with, influence, teach other Jewish people that, believe me, are thirsty. They're thirsty. And number two, let's each of us try to up our own game. Not necessarily for their benefit, for our benefit, but with the understanding and the knowledge that whatever we do to improve our own spiritual lives impacts the rest of the Jewish world. So I want to leave all of us with that challenge and with the blessing that we should all be successful and see, God willing, a transformation of the Jewish people where next year we won't have to worry about why there are so many Jewish people in ashrams and churches. We should worry about why there's not enough room here in Shari Tfilah for all the Jews that are banging down the doors.